Stanford. Excellent. Good evening, everyone. Okay, tonight's webinar is STEM activities for the outdoors. My name is Lindsay Glasner. I'm the Birds with K-12 Outreach Coordinator. I'm joined tonight with Kelly Schaefer, our K-12 Education Specialist, and she's going to be monitoring the chat window. If by chance you have any kind of technical issues at all, or questions, or comments, or stories, or whatever, um, share those with Kelly in the chat window. Quick note for today, you as participants are going to be muted. That just helps us manage the webinar. Your form of communication is going to be through the chat window. So for those of you who are new to our webinars, we're using the Zoom platform. And what I would recommend, you'll see somewhere in your screen a chat button. This is not the Q&A window, just the chat window. I would recommend exiting full screen, and when you click the chat window, it'll actually dock that chat window on your right-hand side. The next thing I recommend doing is you'll see an option to send to all panelists or to all participants or everyone. Please send your messages to everyone. That will help us know, well, one will help us so that if you have a question, others will see where a question is so they know what we're responding to, but also you may have recommendations, advice, so forth, that others may find valuable. So let's test out that chat window and let us know, making sure it's sending to all participants or everyone, where in the world you are coming from. North Carolina, St. Louis, Missouri, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Tennessee, New Jersey, Cincinnati. We have a local, Lansing, New York. Ooh, Canada, we're international. Um, Texas, Minnesota, welcome, welcome, everyone. Y'all were testing some of my knowledge of acronyms. <laughs> Nevada, Florida, welcome everyone. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. We're really excited about today's webinar. We haven't done something like this before, so um, we really appreciate any feedback you guys have. Just send us an email afterwards about what you liked, what you expected, uh, so on and so forth. So, for those of you who have not attended our webinars before, Kelly and I are with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We're based in Ithaca, New York. I saw somebody posted Lansing, New York, which you know is just a hop, skip, and a jump right around the corner from us. And at the Lab of Ornithology, our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. Now, oh, hi, Terry. <laughs> Greetings from Connecticut. Now, specifically, uh, our K through 12 program here at the lab takes all the knowledge and research that happens here, and we develop uh, K through 12 resources that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. Now, again, my name is Lindsay Glasner. I'm the outreach coordinator. Kelly Schaefer is going to be managing our chat window, and she's our education specialist. Between the two of us, we have a wealth of knowledge, but um, we always love being challenged. So be free feel to ask us any questions at all, and we love being uh, tested and help you guys out. So today's topic tonight is all going to be about STEM in the outdoors. So just so we are all on the same page, what is STEM? Not only what STEM the acronym is, but also what do you think of when you think of STEM. So in the chat window, uh, let us know what you think of when you hear the acronym STEM. Kelly's laughing at my owl question mark right now. Yeah. It's really cute, isn't it? So cute. You'll be surprised what you can find in Google searches. Yeah, Joelle, the very simplest term, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Karen, that's a really great point. A lot of people like to bring in the STEAM, or one of the words that I've heard is stream now. Um, so A, if you want to add A for art, R for, for reading purposes. Applying science, technology, engineering, and math to solve real world, real world problems. Solve, I really like that um, verb. 
So Dan, you're a STEM specialist for pre-K through, oh, I'm just minimize that part. There we go. Um, specialist for pre-K and kindergarten, you focus primarily on science, but it's purest form, it's really engineering based. So most people tend to think of technology and engineering. Connie, that's a really great point. Oh, Connie, hi Connie, nice to hear you. Um, you also really wanna think about biology and nature as a science. Absolutely, and Dan, to answer your question, the R in stream is reading. The activities that integrate all of these areas, they solve problems or figure out things. So yeah, when we think of a, a STEM, I mean, it's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I just came back from the National Science Teachers Association Conference in Atlanta, and when I think of STEM and I see STEM in the science world at that conference, I mean, many people are, are looking at the robotics or looking at coding. Um, chemistry is huge. It's something where I look at this, and, and Connie, you brought a great point, that biology, nature, life sciences, that's part of science, and, and that topic and field can meet STEM or STEAM or STREAM or, or whatever uh, acronym you want to use. And Lisa bring up a good point, it's all hands-on. One of the verbs you guys were talking about is solving problems or figuring out things. And so that's really um, the beast, that heart of inquiry that we wanna talk about today. A nature study building observations and writing skills, yeah. So that brings up the point then, we're talking about STEM, but STEM activities in the outdoors. So we'll ask another question to you guys then. Why should we even teach outside? And I may be preaching to the choir to some of you, but it's still worthwhile to even think about this. So Krista, kids learn better when they're active. I saw this great video um, going around. It's a viral video going around through social media around this, um, I, I want to say like no walls based kindergarten or or pre-k that's in Japan where there are very minimal classrooms and really it just allows kids to just run around and be free and really this open based aspect and I like that they learn better when they're active they uh, learning outside allows real world applications it's exciting for the kids to be outside they get excited and get to go do that um, the health benefits such as vitamin D it's inexpensive and accessible, absolutely. They're making connections to their world, to their backyard, um, and engages more of their brains. I love this. We expect kids to care, but if we don't get them outside in the environment, how can they care? This is all wonderful. So yeah, it's, it's like I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys really grasp the concept of why teaching outside is incredibly beneficial. Um, one of the center picture here, the kids getting their hands dirty when they are doing a garden project. To me, that those smiles on their faces is not just a say cheese smile where they're doing it because they're asked to smile. Those are genuine uh, smiles. They're truly interested and excited to get their hands dirty. Many of the themes, uh, math concepts, they come from people who are keenly observed patterns in our world. They've organized in the concepts that we utilize today. That's wonderful, Dan, to really think about. Krista, they need exposure to those soil microbes to stay healthy. Yeah. The nature deficit disorder, yes, that's a very, very common um, hot topic going on right now. And so we really want to connect kids to their local environment. Now there are two themes going on between why we want to teach kids outside and STEM. And we're hitting on these problems of STEM is around, um, some people mentioned the engineering design process, the solving of the problems, having kids critically think. And by getting them outside, we can have them start to critically think and solve problems that are place-based. They are in their local environment uh, while it's further inspiring and enriching them. And that's what we really want to focus on today. So we're going to talk about three different activities. Um, and, and these activities, I guess, are less more of 
30 minutes outdoor teaching activities, but more free processes of going through a nature connection into citizen science, um, into inquiry. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Bird Sleuth, this is how we'd like to structure many of our resources. We really focus on this process of first getting those kids to have that excitement, have that connection to their local environment. And one of the best ways to start facilitating that excitement and to get them connected to the outdoors is through citizen science projects. Now, with citizen science project, it then allows kids to start going through scientific protocols. They can start to make observations and share those observations to the scientific community. Now, naturally, with those observations, they're going to start asking questions. And those questions can really lead off into full inquiry projects. And that's where we can start talking about and supporting kids to develop science practices and meetings and developing STEM skills through solving problems. So we're going to talk about three different, um, I, I want to steer away from the word activities, but three different um, branches that you can take to develop these STEM skills through the outdoors. So before we really dive into this, the key focus here is going to be around citizen science. Now, when we talk about citizen science, it's the heart of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's in both the Bird's Lewis mission as well as the lab's mission. And we think of citizen science as people everywhere who report their observations of the natural world or events that um, they can share by using basic scientific protocols. I love this image here because every dot is a checklist submitted to our largest citizen science project, eBird. And you can see that really citizen science is a partnership. It's a global network where um, everyday people, citizens of the world, can develop this partnership with scientists to answer real world questions. And that last chunk of answering real world questions, that's meeting those STEM skills. One of the things we've learned about with citizen science is many people globally um, still get hung up on the concept of citizen science, specifically the word citizen. And so instead, we like to think of it almost as crowdsourcing science. We're really trying to get every, everybody um, from little kids up into retirees, um, to, no matter the, the race, or gender or religious background to help share their observations. So when looking at this, there are gonna be citizen science projects in every, not every, I don't know actually. There are citizen science projects in a lot of different fields and many, many of them require youth to get outside and connect to their local habitat. There are others such as the star count, which may be online based, but there are many such as eBird, the lab's largest citizen science projects, which are solely focused on um, being outside and observing a local environment. Now what we have here, this is just a tiny, tiny sample of citizen science projects that exist. They range from being on a global scale like Ebert to a um, state or district level where uh, it's really focused on just a community crowdsourcing initiative. Based off of your students' interests and your goals as an educator, I encourage you to look for a citizen science projects that capture what those students are um, intuitively interested in. Now, being at the Lab of Ornithology, we're gonna focus on birds. However, some of the strategies and, and stuff we're going to talk about today can be used in different citizen science projects. The one resource I recommend, Joel, this list is not an exclusive or ex exhausted list by any means, but what I would recommend you going for is SciStarter.com. Kelly, <laughs> not .co, no, .com. 
Kelly will work on her typing skills. But Ooh. there we go. That's a great website to start with where you can put in, say, a region or if it requires a specific age group or curricular resources that you need, they can um, help direct you to the right citizen science project. But let's be honest, though, though ladybugs and trees and worms are cool, we're bird nerds here. So we're going to focus on bird citizen science projects today. And at the lab, we have citizen science, uh, six citizen science projects that are accessible to you all as educators. And they all follow a similar model of identifying and observing birds, collecting data, entering that data online. And what's nice is that you actually have full transparency with our databases. So you can view the online data and this provides a really wonderful opportunity for students and youth to start to analyze and interpret that information. Now, what we're going to discuss with the citizen science projects is how we can go through that science process, which is going to develop skills, the STEM skills such as answering and solving problems through citizen science. And you'll notice that the very first point that citizen science projects require are all about identification and making observation. Now, if you recall the bird sleuth method, we're first gonna connect to nature. And we can do that just by having kids start to identify and observe what's around them. So our first quote unquote activity is going to be around mapping and modeling. This is a wonderful activity that I love doing with both kids and educators, and it's called a sound map. You may have heard it before, I've done modified versions of this, but it's not something that, that gets old. I really love just taking a step outside and mapping or listening to what's around me. So the concept of the sound map is that each kid will go outside with a sheet of paper and draw an X in the middle or like this um, work down here at the bottom, they drew a home uh, that represents them. You can even add directions such as north, south, east, west. Um, you can use drawings, you can use words. But the point of this is to challenge kids to just identify where they are in their habitat and then just start to listen to what's around them. This is a very grounding uh, activity that helps kids just take a step back and truly listen. And it's okay to first focus on um, urban or man-made sounds as well, because that's what we as humans are very common to, to hearing, especially in urban environments. When I first did this activity in Atlanta, um, I had a few minutes in between sessions, so I walked outside and just wanted to listen. And the first thing I heard was traffic and sirens and that's okay that's still stuff we should put on our sound map you'll see in this top one down in the um, bottom it has cars driving and a road drawn and that's something that we want to pay attention to but then as the more and more we listen the more we start to tune out that sound and listen for new sounds such as the wind blowing or um, birds chirping Maybe it could be, um, what did I hear in Atlanta? I heard an insect fly right by my ear. So this is a really great activity to do. Dan, that's a really good question I wanna pose to anybody at the, um, in the discussion. Has anybody done a sound map with kids that are ADD or ADHD? And if so, how did it go with those kids? I personally haven't done it. Kelly, have you? No. Okay. So if anybody has done, um, let us know in the chat window how that worked for you. Hopefully this will help you, Dan. So what we're seeing is I've heard it's been a hit or miss. They find a spot they want to hide in, okay. Um, Margaret, you've heard a talk about green space and ADD kids. Chrissy said it has worked, they hear everything. Margaret, you said the findings are that they really do respond well to green space. 
Okay, so Krista, the key is when doing with ADD and ADHD kids is as soon as they hear a sound to um, eliminate those sounds as they hear them. That's an interesting strategy. That seems to be something I was just talking about that I inherently did myself, but giving them those instructions. Awesome. Yeah, feel free to keep chiming in on those discussions in the chat window. This is a great activity, I think, for all age groups, but I do seem to find it be um, more geared towards the younger audience between K through six, K through seven, especially for the older audiences. Um, when they start to really grasp a concept of proportions and ratios, another great activity to do to start developing the observation skills is conducting a habitat map or model. Now this is something that be done where kids can look from a bird's eye view and really start to create a proportional model of the habitat that's near them. We've done this example and, and study specifically around gardening and habitat improvement projects where kids would have to identify such things as food, water, cover, and space in that habitat through assessment. But this can also be focused on where kids, one, have to bring in some of the mathematics skills of, of modeling purposes, but also they really need to pay attention to what is in their actual environment right next to them so they can create an accurate map or model. This is another a great opportunity. Yes, exactly, Krista. Um, this can be tied in with math by having to make an accurate map first by using tape measures and calibers. Exactly what we're thinking of. Um, again, I, I've seen it done with some younger audiences and those kids tend to start off with a pre-made map and just fill in the objects such as trees or bushes. But especially for older audiences, you know, starting fourth grade upwards, um, really have them develop these accurate models by taking true measurements, maybe almost formulating a grid system that can really help bringing in those programs. So, these first two activities between the sound map and the habitat map are really great to just start developing that natural connection, having kids recognize their place, um, their local surroundings, and start to get them just to develop some observations. From there, we want to go into a citizen science count. Now, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do a live screen sharing from my phone. We haven't done this for our webinars yet, but I've used the technology a little bit before for a webinar. Oh, oh, okay, right, that's a good point. So I have full confidence this will work, um, but you just have to give me a little patience to get the screen sharing up. No, I don't want the microphone on. Start broadcast. Two, one. Okay, right about now, my screen should be sharing. Excellent. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, and you can tell I'm a bird nerd. I have a lot of birding apps. Now the whole purpose of this section is Again, we talked about citizen science. They not only develop observations, but those naturally lead into some questions. And so with citizen science projects, you need several different components. You can start using some technology at the basic level, such as apps, but you can also start bringing in some of the mathematics, um, such as estimations and um, how you can go from there. We're gonna go more into the advanced technology and mathematics in the third activity for more upper age group. This would be technology mathematics for some of the younger age groups. So to participate in citizen science and bird citizen science specifically, you need to be able to accurately count and identify the birds near you. And the very first thing we're gonna recommend is the Merlin Bird ID app. Kelly will share the link in the chat window, but this is just a free app, so if you guys have iPads um, or smartphones in your classroom, you can download the app. The other thing is, bless you, Kelly. The other thing you can do is they're about to completely launch the Merlin website, which will have bird ID available on websites as well, such as Chromebooks and so forth. So let's go to the Merlin bird ID app. Oops. 
I don't want a bird pack right now. So this is what the app looks like for any of you guys who are new to it at all. I'm just gonna go through real quick the five basic steps to identifying birds. So I'm gonna press start bird ID and it's gonna determine my location. I guess I should actually, I don't know if I have cellular service on, but I know I'm near Lansing, New York, so we're gonna just choose that. And we're gonna choose today's date. Now, this morning I saw ooh, a blue jay flying by. And so we're just gonna do this off memory, testing a bird I actually know. Now, blue jay, or should I start with Merlin? It's gonna first ask me what size was the bird? You know, was it sparrow sized? Was it goose sized? Was it between a, a robin and a crow? Now, Callie, if you had to guess, what size roughly is a, is a blue jay? I think between a robin and a crow is a good guess. That's what I would think too. So we're going to start with a, um, putting the size of the bird was between a robin and a crow and hit next. Then we have to choose what were the three main colors and we're going to select up to three colors. Now I know blue jay has some blue in it. Has a little bit of white too. Do you think we should put in a third color? Should we put in some black? I think you could probably try it with two and see what happens. Okay, we're going to try it with two and see what happens. That's the nice thing. We don't have to choose three, just up to three. And then what was the bird doing? Okay, this blue jay was soaring or flying. He was actually flying between trees. So let's just try soaring and flying first. And then we're going to hit next. And based off of that information, the smart app is going to decide um, what bird we're likely going to see based off of other information. Now this is fun. The most likely bird based off of the clues you put in are going to be at the very top. So based off of the information that other people put in, it's suggesting that it was a belted kingfisher. Beautiful bird, but not what we saw. Same with an American kestrel or a cooper's hawk. Oh, there it is. There is our blue jay. Interesting. So we can say, yes, this was my bird. We can also look at some details. We can scroll through and see other pictures. That's the view I got, um, the blue jay flying by. If we wanted to, we could even play some of the sounds or look at the range map of where you're likely to find a blue jay. But I know that this is the bird I saw, so this is my bird. I'm gonna rate you later. So this is super great in the fact of most kids can answer these types of questions. If we wanted to go back, say, oh, you know, I'm just curious, what if we had put black in there as well? So I went down to the very bottom and I'm gonna go back to editing these colors. Now I'm gonna add black to it, just out of curiosity. And it was soaring or flying. What are gonna be the likely birds that come up? Belted Kingfisher, Kestrel, ooh, Blue Jay is now third, not fourth. So again, this is just a smart app where it comes up with the different clues but it's a really great opportunity for you and your students to identify what birds are in your area. Yes, I wanna start over. Another feature that Merlin Bird ID has is if you have some form of photography available in your classroom, your kids can take pictures and can actually um, show or sorry, they can take pictures, upload that photo into the photo ID, <laughs> take photos, upload into the photo ID, and have Marlon identify the app or the, um, the bird for you. I don't think I, I'm trying to think right now if I have a bird photo on my phone right now, and I don't think I do. Finally, the other thing you guys can do, just because this is a feature that most people don't realize, if I went back to the home, I'm going down to the very bottom and pressing explore birds. Now, once you have Merlin on your phone, you can go to this top right corner and you can identify the location. So I was just in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we're gonna update that to Lansing, New York, since that's where I am right now. And say I wanted to see what birds I'm likely going to see during peak migration in May. I'm gonna alter this date to be May 20th. So click on specific date, put May 20th. Ooh, thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, and I have sort by most likely. Based off of that, Merlin will tell me what are the most likely birds that I'm going to find 
at that location and that time. This is a great tool for you as educators to help develop um, a sample checklist or a pre-designed checklist for people to fill in with tallies. And again, I can click on any of these. There's our blue jay there. I can click on him and see more photos and so forth. Okay, Kelly was able to pull up a bird photo for me. So we're gonna do get photo ID real quick just so you can see this feature. <laughs> okay, we'll do that later then. Um, Cause I just got a new phone and I apparently don't have photo ID on my <laughs> app yet. So yes, as many saying, Merlin is a great tool. Um, it's a wonderful bird identification tool that we strongly recommend. And it can be used with most age groups. It does take some guidance for the younger age groups, especially when you talk about size. Comparing size to birds can be a little tricky. But once kids have that identification of a bird, they can then share those observations to a citizen science project like eBird. So I'm gonna go back to my birding apps. Oh, look at those lovely apps. And we're going to go see eBird. Now, for those of you who have used the Merlin Bird ID app in, um, with any kids at all, would you mind just sharing in the chat window what age group you used it with, just so people can get a, a sense, whether age group or grade, just specify, just so people can see how it's, if it's been successful or not with that group. And as you're doing that, I'm gonna introduce you guys to eBird. As young as three years old and as old as 94. Wow, Krista, okay. So just from Krista's point of view, basically anybody and everybody can use Merlin Bird ID. That's awesome. So when it comes to the eBird app, again, Merlin is all about how to identify birds. eBird is all about sharing the bird observations. The first question I always have people ask me is, if I say, this is my bird on Merlin, will that be linked and be shared with eBird? The answer right now is no. Um, however, we are working on it. Now, the concept of citizen science is that everybody can share their observations, but they're following basic scientific protocols. Now, with eBird, those protocols are such things as location, time spent birding, how many people were birding with you, um, and the total number of species seen during that time. This protocol helps researchers at the lab and researchers around the world even understand the effort it took to see the birds reported. That effort is really important. What it means is it helps us better understand and, uh, bird populations the frequency, the abundance. And so that's significantly important for us to follow those protocols. Right now, Merlin doesn't have those protocols embedded. So by just saying this is my bird and sharing that with eBird, that doesn't have very much valuable data to share with eBird because we don't know the effort yet. So we recognize that there's a desire for linking Merlin and eBird, and we're troubleshooting that problem so that they can be linked but still gain valuable data for eBird. Uh, Margaret's asking, are there apps like, um, like this to identify trees and flowers? LeafSnap. Leaf yeah, LeafSnap is the one I've heard of. I personally have not used it, but from my understanding is that you take a picture and it will help identify the birds. Um, Krista just mentioned iNaturalist. If you saw in my birding apps, iNaturalist was there. That's used for um, any and all natural things outside. What it is is you take a picture of anything living with iNaturalist, you can upload it to the iNaturalist app, and the community can help you identify what it is. Um, and then Teresa is saying that Audubon also has several apps around plants and insects as well. Cool. Thank you. So let's talk about eBird and how to share these observations. Again, we're gonna show the eBird mobile app. This can all be done as well online, but with most kids nowadays, they have a phone or you guys have technology in the classroom. I find the mobile app addicting, where anytime I see a bird, I'm constantly on eBird mobile sharing it. However, the same protocols and steps can all be taken on their website. 
So we're going to start a new checklist. And I talk about the basic protocols that eBird needs to understand effort. And the first thing you need to understand was where were you birding? Um, you'll see different options like choose a recent location or a location from a map. Many of you guys will um, choose a nearby hotspot. So a hotspot is a public recommended location by other birders where you're likely going to see birds. Um, so you'll either choose a nearby hotspot such as a park or something like that or choose a new personal location. For us, we're going to choose a nearby hotspot since I know there are quite a few at the lab. Assuming it can require my relocation. I know, my, my phone's not too happy with me now. Unfortunately, in the lab, I have really bad service. Oh, there we go. Um, and we're in Sapsucker Woods. That's where the lab is. Yes, exactly, Dan. The T in STEM. This is the technology components. Um, we're in the built lab building area, Sapsucker Woods. So I'm going to choose that as our hotspot. And you'll see it said downloading checklist. What it was just doing was taking all the bird species that have been reported at that hotspot and creating a checklist of most likely birds I'm going to be seeing based off of what has been seen before. Again, we're going to need to know the date and time that you went birding. You can manipulate those so maybe you're submitting past records, but this is a live checklist, so we're going to do that now. And finally, now it gets to the fun part of actually sharing our bird observations. The one thing you will notice on the top is that it has a timer that's starting to count. This is counting um, up to when we started the checklist. And then we also have 0.00, .00 miles. So with apps, what the nice thing about this is we actually can have our phone track our location and identify exactly where we walked while we birded. This is incredibly valuable for the eBird team because they can um, assess truly what your effort was, how far you traveled, um, what habitats you traveled through to see these birds. What is a cackling goose? That is a um, I want to say it's a smaller version of a Canada goose. They look nearly identical to a Canada goose, except they they're have smaller and cuter. Yeah, they're smaller and cuter. They have slightly shorter necks and shorter bills, um, rounder, face. rounder face. Yeah, they're a slightly cuter version of a Canada goose, but a completely different species. So, and that's why oftentimes you'll see a cackling Canada goose because they're very difficult to identify. So we could go through and say, um, I can scroll down this list over and over, or I can just go right on the top and type in a species name or code, and it's a number. So automatically, you'll come up to number first, say we saw our blue jay. I'm going to put one in space, and that will automatically take me to my text, and then type in blue jay. And you'll see automatically, smart shirts takes me right to blue jay. I can press that. And voila, you'll all see at the top, it's showing me my likely birds. If I wanted to, I can click all the birds, which means all birds that have never been reported in this area, but maybe an option. Um, but it's, it's best to just stay with the likely. And then finally say, okay, that's, that's all I saw, which is my one blue jay. Um, maybe I, I went to the top, press checked, if I wanted to, I can go through and say, oh, but I also saw five Canada geese. I saw, for example, one cackling goose and maybe 20 common grackles because all of our grackles are just flooded in right now. I can still start adding all this information in afterwards. Now, this is really valuable because it's eBird is keeping track of all my time right now. Again, if I was moving, it's keeping track of all the distance. And based off of that, it will then tell me, it will tell me, okay, that's all I saw, let's review and submit. And the last me, are you done birding? If you leave this checklist now, eBird will stop recording um, your tracking. That's the distance I traveled. 
Um, the rest of your data will remain editable. Are you sure you're done? Yes, I want to stop my tracking. I'm done birding. Now we're talking about basic scientific protocols. So the first thing it's gonna ask you is, are you submitting a complete checklist? Now let's first open up what a complete checklist is. Now Ebert says, we want to find out whether you're reporting all the birds you were able to identify to the best of your ability. Answer yes to this question when you record every species presence that you found, not just the highlights. We realize that all birds are not identifiable and observer abilities vary. You should always answer yes to this question unless you are purposely excluding some species, such as a European starling. From your checklist, you do not need to count all the individuals present to answer yes to this question. You can always enter X for the species you observed but did not count. Please do try to report all species. It improves our ability to analyze data. So in summary, you always want to answer yes, unless you are specifically omitting a species. And this again, it says to the best of your ability. It's okay if you couldn't identify that one bird that quickly flew overhead and you really didn't get a good look at it. What you're focusing on is identifying everything you possibly could, because that helps Everd identify the effort. So for this checklist, we'll say, yes, this is the best to our ability. Then it's gonna have you choose an observation type. Were you traveling? Were you staying at one point? For us, we stayed at one point, so this would be stationary. It would ask you the number of observers, so say it's just Kelly and I here. There are two of us. And then duration. If you press the little stopwatch, it automatically counts your duration for you. And then finally, you can add any comments on the checklist. The one thing that Kelly is, um, really emphasize when it comes to eBird that I appreciate is estimations. Though eBird says you can always put an X for the presence or absence of a species, that's not as valuable to eBird as say putting in an actual number. So what we recommend is how to teach estimations to kids. Kelly, do you want to share one strategy that you use? Uh, sure. So when you see a large number of birds say a flock of geese, it can be challenging to count each and every one. So a good strategy to use is count what 10 looks like and then you kind of multiply that image as you look at the bird. So um, if they're like relatively evenly packed in the space, then you can use that to help estimate numbers. Uh, another way that folks will do it, looking at birds flying, is you count how many you can see in a binocular view and then move your binoculars and estimate that way. So there are a number of different techniques that you can use, um, and there's a number of techniques outlined on the eBird website too that you can always check. But it's a great way to bring some math skills into your outdoor observations, practice, estimation, and to talk about why having an estimate is better than no number in the case like this, because that is really useful for um, biological data sets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just for, for your um, knowledge, when it comes to estimating birds, eBird cares about um, to the tenths, hundredths, thousands, etc. cetera. Um, they're not going to care about the difference between 58 versus 59, but they will care about 50 versus 100 versus 1,000. Um, so that's also trying to get estimates to that extent with a large flock is very valuable. So this is the eBird database. Once you go through this process, this is a made up checklist, so I'm not going to hit submit. But this is where you guys go through the process of hitting submit. One recommendation I really have for educators, um, if you're in a classroom, have a classroom eBird account. This is where an account that you as a teacher can manage. All your students can share the observations to that one account. We don't recommend having each student having their own account, um, just because it can get confusing. You don't want to have each student submitting the same exact checklist because that's duplicating data. If you are, say, an informal educator, you work at a nature center or something, having an account for your nature center, there goes my screen, um, would, no, just 
turned off. <laughs> having a phone, um, a phone for your, having um, an account for your location is really valuable. Excellent. So with doing that, another great thing that I highly recommend with citizen science counts is say you have the kids split up into groups of three or four. The kids can go out and go count separately, but as a large group, come back together and talk about and discuss what were your estimates. Okay, if Jimmy and Susie saw five Blue Jays, but um, Robbie and Billy saw eight Blue Jays, what is the best estimate that we should submit to the eBird database and having those discussions there. So we've gone through the process first about creating a sound map and a habitat map about first building observations, doing some modeling programs with the mapping. Then we talked about how to bring in um, bird identification and using those observations to participate in citizen science and use some math and technology. Now we wanna bring it full circle and talk about how you can take that information and analyze it. So to give you perspective, the eBird database, at the end of 2017, we had more than 400 million observations. At this point in 2018, we're now over 500 million observations. Um, that's over 28 million hours of birding that people have volunteered their time to do in every country in the world. And to give you perspective, that's, neat, that's over 98% of the world's bird species reported, which is a massive database. And like I talked about is you have complete access to that database. And this brings in our third component of data analysis. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna guide you through the eBird database and how you as educators can access this different information and develop that problem solving and mathematical components and technology components that kids can use with this science framework. So we're gonna to go to the eBird database. Excellent, it is eber.org. If you haven't been on recently in the last month, this may look new to you. They did just get um, a new homepage and website. And in that process, they also have um, a new tab called the Science tab. So what I'm first gonna do is going to introduce you guys to the Science tab here. And they'll go through talking about you know, several different models. You can download eBird data products. You can learn about their conservation. You can also learn about the eBird modeling. And I'm gonna learn more about the eBird modeling specifically. Now we can scroll down. This will describe how the modeling happens, but I want us to look at some of these models. Now let's look at, I'm gonna look at the wood thrush because I know Kelly has a sweet spot for wood thrushes in her heart. It's true, I do. <laughs> so let's look at the wood thrush. And we see this nice gray map. And I'm gonna press play for you. Now if you notice on that bottom left corner, it's starting to go through the dates. Started off in January and now it's going through into April. And we notice that we have this beautiful orange starting to cover all the Eastern United States. Now, if you can't see, that orange is representing relative abundance or the counts in per kilometer per hour. And it's showing the relative abundance of a wood thrush each week I think it's maybe two, yeah, every week throughout the entire year. And this is a model that's been developed using eBird data. And it's really neat, it totally is, Margaret. I love the enthusiasm because this is what the eBird data is helping us understand, developing these models, helping scientists better understand the current state of bird populations, what habitats they're using, and how we can better protect them. So this is a really fun model for, for Dan, say your pre-K and kindergarten kids, just to play something like this and have them ask, okay, what are we seeing? This is called migration. This is the movement to getting further down um, 
down further with older kids and start looking at trends into data. So there's several of these models available. The next thing I want to go by is the Explore tab. Now the Explore tab has many different things such as exploring regions and hotspots and species maps. And this has a lot of information for birders to find out, you know, where's the next place to go birding or where's the next bird to see. But as educators, we can look at these bar charts. So I'm going to click on bar charts here and it's going to first ask me to choose a location. So let's look at the United States and you know what? I was originally from Arizona, and so let's look at the entire state of Arizona. And I'm going to press continue down here. Huh? Oh. So here's all of Arizona. You can see the location here, and you can see the entire date range. The eBird database goes back to 1900, and it's using all data up to today. And we can start to see these bar charts forming. So here's a black-bellied whistling duck, a really cool waterfowl. And the green is showing, it looks like, you know, this, this duck is present most of the year, at least in small numbers, but is more abundant in the summer to um, fall months. Unlike a snow goose, which really doesn't have much presence in Arizona during the, the summer months, but is more abundant, so to say, in the winter months, the January and December time period. We scroll down further, we can see that though the black-bellied whistling duck and the snow goose may have been around year-round, they never were as abundant as, say, this mallard. These bar charts are even um, more abundant, higher, uh, larger. So what we can do is we can go through this process and I can click on any one of these names. Let's, let's click on the mallard here. And immediately it's going to pull up a line graph for me. And we can start seeing the frequency of mallards reported within Arizona, this entire region. Now, Though this graph may seem a little deceptive that there are no mallards reported come August 1st, that frequency ends at 12%. So let's add a comparison species. I'm gonna go up here to the top left. I'm gonna to go to species and click change species here. Now I can select up to five species to compare it to. So let's go back to our black bellied whistling duck. I'm gonna hit continue. Now the bar charts are still right up here at the top, and we can see the difference, but we can also look at our, our line graphs here, and that really helps us see the significant difference of frequency between a black-bellied whistling duck and a mallard. Now this is just another way to start going through data analysis. If you wanted to, you can have students um, compare and contrast different species or different families of birds. They can start looking and saying, okay, um, I'm seeing the mallard that's having the significant dip right at the beginning of August. Because this data is actual sightings, what is happening with this bird? Is it the fact that there are less birders out birding on August 1st? Is it that the ducks maybe are migrating up north more? Or what's this sharp spike happening all of a sudden right in February 15th? Um, it, was there a bird, um, were just no birds out, or, or what was happening there? So this is a really great opportunity for um, students to start to analyze and interpret this data. Again, we're taking that connection they made outside and then starting to analyze it both inside within the citizen science database. So with that, we have five minutes to spare. Uh, Kelly and I, I know she's been typing away next to me, so you guys have been having some great conversations and questions. But Kelly and I will take any further questions you guys have. You're welcome to put them in the chat window. This webinar was recorded. We'll make the recording available Friday morning um, after our Thursday webinar. We'll also, if you are interested in receiving a certificate of completion, 
do let us know. You can email us, birdsleuth at cornell.edu. I'll send you that certificate tomorrow morning. It's one contact hour for this webinar. And you can also join Kelly on social media. What do you say? <laughs> they call it social media, but it's actually quite lonely. So feel free to at me on Twitter. Exactly. Um, with that, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Kelly and I will hang out to answer any questions you may have.